Good morning. It's good to be with you this morning. Uh, when the opportunity came up and we were going to kind of switch, Mike was going to go to Almaden and I was coming here. I was looking forward to that. And uh, I'm excited for the opportunity to be with you this morning. And I appreciate so much uh, you having me here. And, and I was glad Judah was able to come with me. He's my, he's my travel buddy uh, a lot of times when I go places. We have three boys and uh, Judah's the oldest. And uh, so since he was really little, he's always been my travel buddy when I go places. So it's good for him to be able to come to. If you have your Bibles, you can open back up to Philippians chapter 4. Uh, Philippians chapter 4 is where we're going to start with our lesson this morning. And uh, we're going to do something this morning that I enjoy doing, and I don't get to do all that often. And that is we're going to have a sermon that's geared around a song that we sing. So while you're turning to Philippians 4 and you get there, uh, I believe the song will be up on the screen in just a little bit. But I also want you to just go ahead and get your songbooks out if there's one close by. Uh, because we're going to talk through some of the verses, and it'll be number 626. Number 626 will be the song that we're going to be using this morning for our lesson. Appreciate the scripture reading that was selected. Mike helped me out with that, and, and that works really well with our lesson. Uh, so the main ser- le- uh, verse that we're going to be looking at, and we're going to come to that in just a second. But I want to tell you a story first. It's a story about a man named Horatio G. Spafford. He was a successful lawyer and businessman in Chicago with a lovely family, wife Anna, and five children, uh, four at the time of the events that take place. They were not strangers to tears and tragedy. The young son died with pneumonia in 1871. At the same year, much of their business was lost in the Great Chicago Fire. On November 20, uh, on November 21st. 1873, the French ocean liner, Ville de Havre, was crossing the Atlantic from the U.S. to Europe with 313 passengers on board. Among the passengers were Mrs. Spafford and their four daughters. Although Mr. Spafford had planned to go with his family, he had found it necessary to stay in Chicago to help solve uh, an unexpected business problem. He uh, told his wife he would join her and their children in Europe a few days after taking uh, a few days later, taking another ship. About four days into the crossing of the Atlantic, the ship collided with a powerful iron-hulled Scottish ship, the Lake Urn, and suddenly all of those on board were in grave danger. Anna brought her four children to the deck. She knelt there with Annie, Margaret, uh, Margaret Lee, Bessie, and Tanetta, and prayed for that God would spare them if that could be his will, or to make them willing to endure whatever awaited them. Approximately 12 minutes later, the ship was beneath the dark waters of the Atlantic, carrying some 226 of the passengers, including the four Spafford children. A sailor rowing a small boat over the spot where the ship went down spotted a woman floating on a piece of the wreckage, and it was Anna, still alive. He pulled her into the boat, and they were picked up by another large vessel, which landed in Cardiff Wells nine days later. From there, she wired her husband a message which began, Saved alone, what shall I do? Mr. Spafford later framed the telegram and placed it in his office. Another of the ship survivors, Pastor Weiss, later recalled Anna saying, God gave me four daughters. Now they have been taken from me. Someday I will understand why. Mr. Spafford booked passage on the next available ship and left to join his grieving wife. With the ship about four days out, the captain called Spafford to his cabin and told him they were over the place where his children went down. According to Bertha Spafford Vester, a daughter born after the tragedy, Spafford wrote, it is well with my soul while he was on the journey to meet up with his wife. In Philippians chapter 4, Paul writes about our thanksgiving And he tells us to pray. He tells the church at Philippi to pray continually. But he says in verse 7, he says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We just sang, Jesus is coming soon. When we're singing these songs, do we mean what we're singing? We don't know when Jesus is going to return. But how many times 
do the scriptures speak of the disciples wanting him to come quickly? It takes peace to want Jesus to return quickly. Because as people who understand what the Bible teaches, we understand that when Jesus returns, that that will begin the process of the judgment that the Bible talks about. Those who are alive will be raised up and caught up together with them in the skies. And we're going to read in just a little bit in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10 that we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of the things that we've done, whether good or evil. And so we understand what's happening, but are we ready for that to come? Paul gives us a really great example of what it looks like to be at peace with God. Earlier on in the same letter in Philippians, in chapter 1, he writes and he says, For me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. He goes on to say, but for your sakes, I'm going to live on because you need me. But I would rather go and be with the Lord. Can you say this morning that you would rather go and be with the Lord? If you're not ready to make that claim, I might suggest that it might be because you don't understand the love and the greatness and the goodness of what the Bible says it will be like when we go to be with the Lord. Paul says in, in Philippians chapter 3, he talks about who he was as a Jew before he became a Christian. He was a Jew of Jews. He had studied at the feet of one of the great teachers of the time. And he says, verse 7 of chapter 3, But everything that was a gain to me I have considered to be a loss because of Christ. More than that, I consider everything to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Because of Him I have suffered the loss of all things and consider them as, uh, as dung so that I may gain Christ. Can I suggest that Paul being able to say that is him speaking because he is at peace with God? That he is able to move from his former life, which for Paul, it meant giving up what would have been his job. Everything that he had studied for up until that point, he had to change. All of the wealth, I think, that would have been included in being a Pharisee, he had to give that, lay that aside. And then he, had to, he was called by Jesus to go into the known world and to tell everybody that Jesus was the king. He was the Messiah, the anointed one, to which the Jews in the, in the synagogues in those cities persecuted him. In one city, several people had followed him from different cities. They came to Lystra. In Acts chapter 14, they drug him outside of the city and they stoned him and they left him for dead. Why did he give up? all the great things that he had to go do that. When he writes the letter to the church at Philippi, he's sitting in a Roman prison because he believes Jesus is the Lord. And he's been called a troublemaker because of that. The peace of God that surpasses all comprehension will guard, that's a key part of that verse, isn't it? Will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Our hearts and minds need to be guarded, don't they? Because the world tells us to be afraid of everything. And I'm not just speaking about the COVID stuff. I'm not talking about being unwise. I'm talking about death, ultimately. Think about how much is wrapped up in us fearing death. Maybe it's medically. Maybe it's our doctor's appointments and the things that we do to keep ourselves healthy. Maybe it's the diets that we eat and the exercise that we do. We want to keep our body as healthy as we can because that's the way that we live longer. Brothers and sisters, the Bible teaches us that in Christ we have life eternal. I'm not saying we don't do all those things to stay healthy, but understand my point. But what about the things that we don't do because we're afraid? Do we speak about our faith? Do we talk to our coworkers and our neighbors and our friends and our relatives because we know the one whom we have believed in and we are convinced that he is able to keep 
what we have given to him until he returns? Do we speak about our faith? Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. We come back to our story with this family and how tragic. Right? From a worldly perspective, we would say that's a terrible loss. Even in our minds, we're thinking that's a terrible loss. Can I suggest to you maybe a statement that David made that helps us understand why Miss Anna Spafford was able to think and say the things that she did in trusting God? David, after he lost his son that was born to Bathsheba, he had fasted and fasted and he was waiting to see if the baby would recover and it didn't, the baby died. And in faith, David said, the child will not return to me, but I will go to him. I think it can be helpful to put some context around the songs that we sing. So that when we sing these words, because Paul says when we're singing, we're teaching and admonishing one another, right? And sometimes, I don't know about you, but for me, sometimes I've sang some of these songs so frequently that it becomes habit, right? I'm just singing the tune and I'm thinking about what I'm about to go do afterwards. Or I'm thinking about like keeping the kids sitting still. Or I'm, are we focusing on the words that we're singing when we sing? So this morning, what I want us to do is I want us to take this song, It Is Well With My Soul, that was written by Mr. Spafford. And I want us to use it to help us, hopefully, have a greater peace in our eternal reward. That's the goal that we're shooting for this morning. A greater peace in our eternal reward. We have to be able to trust that God is able to do what he promised he would do. Verse 1 says this, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Whatever my lot. Says the man whose four daughters were at the bottom of the ocean, their bodies were, as he's riding the boat across the sea. Whatever my lot. I don't know what your lot is. I don't know what you're going through right now. Maybe right now you're going through really good things. Praise God. But maybe your lot right now is difficult and trying. Whatever my lot, God has taught us to say, it is well. In, first, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Verses 6 through 10, Paul writes and he says, in writing about eternity, that's what's in this context. Because if you'll remember at the end of chapter 4 and the first part of chapter 5, he's talking about this earthly tent that won't last forever. In verse 6, therefore being always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. We are of good courage. I say and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him because he's our Lord. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for the deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Paul challenges us, doesn't he? His faith challenges me regularly when I'm reading the things that he wrote. Because he says, in writing to the church at Corinth, he's, he's kind of saying, you too. We have as our ambition, whether at home or absent. But wouldn't we rather be at home with the Lord? Would you rather be at home with the Lord? Or are there things in this life that are tying you down and keeping your faith from fully being lived out. Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say it is well 
it is well with my soul. In times of peace, in times of trial, we can't let factors dictate our faith. Our faith must dictate how we live through the things that we're going through in our life. Though Satan should buffet, verse 2, those trials should come. Let this blessed assurance control that Christ hath regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. Romans chapter 5, Paul writes and he says, For while we were still helpless, in verse 6, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we should be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever would believe in Him will not perish but have eternal life. John 3.16 Do you know that Jesus cares for you? Do you know that He loves you? We sing another song. He loves me so. Are you familiar with that song? Why did my Savior come to earth and do all, go through all the challenging and trialing things that He went through? Because He loved me so. Satan is a roaring lion. And he wants to devour you and me. And he's looking for people whose trust in God is wavering. But God is so loving and so merciful that He sent Jesus to show us true power. Because we can be tempted to think that Satan's power is taking over the world. But Jesus said, I have overcome the world. Because if we get too caught up and watching the news, and listening to all the terrible things because there are terrible things going on in our world. There are terrible things going on in our country. There are terrible things taking place and terrible people are doing them. And we can get jaded to think that there is no God. Because why are all these terrible things happening? But if we read the Bible story, God has told us that the whole, that whole premise is flawed. This world is not our home. We're just saying that, right? God sent Jesus to overcome this world. Peter writes in 2 Peter chapter 3, and he tells us that this world is destined for destruction. Satan doesn't have power to stop that. Eternal life means that we live beyond that. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And I'm going to come back and I'm going to bring you to that place. And the disciples say, "What? we don't even know where you're going. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. While we were helpless, at the right time, Christ died for. It says ungodly. That's the word Paul uses, right? Could we insert he died for us. Without the blood of Jesus washing away our sins, we're left in an unclean, ungodly state. Praise God that He sent His Son. Praise God that He sent Jesus and Jesus thought about us. He cared for us. Verse 3 is packed full in this psalm of really challenging and helpful thoughts. I want to point out two of them in this verse. He says, My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin not in part but the whole. 
is nailed to His cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, my soul. I don't know about you, but that seems counterintuitive to think of our sin and then to think, oh, the bliss of our sin. That's not really what he's saying, is it? He's saying, oh, the bliss of the thought that Jesus nailed our sins to the cross. My sin, not in part, but the whole. The debt of sin is a heavy burden to bear. And if we can't rid ourselves of the guilt of sin, how can we really live? I think about this from the perspective of the Hebrew writer here. In Hebrews chapter 10, the Hebrew writer says, Every priest would stand daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But he, Jesus, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. It is finished. Waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering he is perfected for all time. Those who are sanctified. My wife and I had the opportunity, this is several years ago now, we were studying with a, a couple of young girls. They were twin sisters. They lived a very, very rough life. Very rough. Uh, to the point that they hadn't graduated high school. They didn't have their driver's license. They were having a hard time finding a job, and that, as you can imagine, And we, we had studied with them and we had helped them and my wife took them to go take their driver's test and she we did just help, you know, help them out. But as we were studying and they got really interested in the Bible story. You know, Jesus said, I came to help those who need a physician. But they got to a point in the study and they looked at my wife and they said, I don't know that we can be baptized because Jesus could never forgive us of all the things that we've done. And so we talked to him a little bit more about that. Eventually they were baptized. But I wonder how, much, how many times the guilt of our sin weighs us down so much that it has Satan tempting us and lying to us and telling us, oh, God would never take us back. You know, Jesus told a parable about that, didn't he? The parable of the sons. And the one son took all of his father's stuff. He said, give me my inheritance. And he went away and he threw it all away to the point that he was eating with the pigs that he was taking care of. That's a double negative thing for a Jew, right? And he stopped and he thought, my father's servants have it better. But you know what his father didn't do? He came back and his father met him and he put a robe on him. He didn't make him be a servant. He took him back as his son. You know why Jesus is telling that parable? It's in the middle of, it's at the end of parables in Luke 15 about joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. That God will take you in. Christ died for you. And His blood is good enough to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In 1 John chapter 1, John writes to Christians. And he reminds Christians, he says, if you say that you do not have any sin, you are a liar and the truth is not in you. Confess your sins. You remember... You're familiar with how the rest of that goes. Confess your sins and He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. Because we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He goes on to say in chapter 2, my sin not in part, but the whole. True peace comes from knowing true forgiveness. But that takes us trusting God, trusting His Word. At the end of the sermon in chapter, Acts chapter 2, Peter is preaching to a group of people who he convicts them of having the Messiah put to death. This Jesus whom you crucified is now Lord and King. And they said, Peter, what should we do? What are we going to do about this? And he says, repent and be baptized. Have your sins washed away. 
Or he actually says in Acts chapter 2, he says, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. That's an accounting term. It means that debt is wiped clean. My sin not in part, but the whole. And then I want to spend just a minute on this image is nailed to the cross. This is an accusation. In Colossians chapter 2, we see this kind of picture. When you were dead in your transgressions and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, He made you alive together with Him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. And when He had disarmed the rulers and the authorities, He made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through Him. The image there that Paul gives us is the picture of the king writing out a decree against us because of our sins. He is accusing us of being unworthy. And Paul says Jesus took all those decrees and He put them on His cross so that everyone could know that through Jesus, the decree is wiped out. Notice what it says. He has canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us. How? Because Jesus went to the cross and shed His blood for our sins. And then the last verse, which goes along with the song we just sang, thinking about Jesus' return, and what better place to find hope and peace in a terrible situation in your life. But look at what it says, And Lord, haste the day when the faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with Him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. What this song is saying and what we're singing to each other is we're saying, I'm ready to meet Jesus. I'm ready to meet Jesus. And that gives me peace. Really, that peace of God that surpasses all comprehension, it guards us from the fear of death, from the temptations and the persecutions in this world. It guards our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. It comes because we know. We know that He will return. And He will bring us to Him. And He will take us to that place that He has prepared for us. Are you able to sing and Lord haste the day? Do you think about that phrase, when the faith will be sight? We walk by faith and not by sight, but there will be a day. There will be a day when we won't need faith to see Jesus. He'll he'll be right in front of us. Faith will be fulfilled in His returning. The peace that Paul writes about, it really means that you're confident in His promises and that you're ready to be with Him. Like, Think about what Jesus is able to do. The power to save, the power to heal, and the power to bring peace all through His blood. Can we sing this song? We do that. We're going to sing all four verses. And what I want to do when we sing this song is I want us on verse 3, we're going to start singing softly. And then when we get to the part that said is is nailed to the cross, we're going to sing a little bit louder. And then in the fourth line, we're going to sing a little bit quicker tempo. When he like a river attendeth my way when sorrows like sea bellows roll whatever my love thou hast taught me to say it is well 
Psalm 49, verse 15, says, But God will redeem my soul from the power of Sheol, for he will receive me. Do you trust in the Lord with all your heart? Do you believe that he is able to receive you? Do you believe that Jesus will return and take us to the place that is prepared for us for all eternity? Maybe you're here this morning and you're, you've not been sure of that and you want to know more. Talk to someone. Let us study with you from God's word, not our word, but God's word and give you a reason for the hope that is in us that Jesus will do just what he said he would do. Maybe you're here this morning and you're ready to obey the gospel. What joy that would be to return to the Lord, to be his child, to be buried in the waters of baptism, have your sins nailed to his cross, washed away by his blood, forgiven, raised up to walk a life in service to him. Maybe you're here this morning and you realize that you have not been living by faith in your life because you have not been trusting in the promises of God. We all go through peaks and valleys in our faith. Praise God that we have other people who are serving the Lord that we can come to. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Maybe you need the prayers of the congregation this morning. Whatever the case is, whatever your need is, if you'll let that be made known, we're going to stand and sing the song that's been selected for our encouragement.